So if you reload, 300 blackout just saves you money. tactical and we also have in our presence the great cat of great cat tactical um, anyway today's video is going to be a review of my Jaegerworks P10C uh, if you're already bored from the intro and stuff I have time stamps, stamps down below if you want to skip around in the video if you're looking for a particular aspect of this video uh, feel free to do that um, otherwise really quickly I want to say thank you to those of you who saw the first video and gave me good feedback on that. Really appreciate it, very encouraging. Uh, I just wanna say real quick, I am not law enforcement military. I don't have any like expert experience in any of this stuff. So I'm just a normal guy who likes shooting and building guns. Uh, that is my perspective. That's how I'm reviewing this stuff. Uh, so take that for what it is. You saw my first video, you know that my carry gun for the past like year and a half, two years has been a Dan Wesson 1911 chambered in nine millimeter. Um, it's a commander size, really love that gun. Uh, you can hear me talk about it for like, ages in the previous video but uh, the point is just that that's a very different gun than the p10 so the perspective obviously is going to be a little bit different as well um, but yeah without further ado let's just get right into the review we'll start by talking about what exactly this gun is obviously it's a p10c uh, i'm not going to do a huge in-depth overview of this because i'm sure you've seen uh, you know 40,000 other videos and there's a ton out there There's a ton, ton of really good ones So if you want to know all the specs and stuff and you want to learn about this gun as it were stock um, Go ahead and search one up on YouTube, but I, I'm not gonna make this video into that I feel like there's too many of those videos um, But really quickly I do want to go over uh, so this is actually a gen 2 I don't know if they call it a gen 2, but it was a near new serial number for 2019 um, after a certain point and the new serialized ones or Gen 2, whatever you want to call them, uh, they have a couple of main differences. This one's obviously all kitted out, so other than the differences that I'm going to point out, you can ignore all the other mods. Uh, but the main things are going to be that you have a single-sided mag, oops, <laughs> a single-sided mag release there. Uh, it is reversible, so you lefties will have to kind of switch this around, but it works a lot better. Right out of the box, it's usable, whereas the first gen, from what I've heard, they were super tight. Um, the other thing is that if you look in the back plate here, you have this little notch cut out there. 
What that's for is to immobilize the striker carrier assembly, whatever you want to call it. Basically, all the parts inside here past the back plate that house your striker, your striker spring, and so on. Um, in the old models, they did tend to rotate a little bit just because they weren't fit into the slide that tight. And truth be told, they're still not fit into the, into the slide, slide that tight right now. It's just that that little notch gives them a chance to have like a little wing off of that assembly that holds it from rotating. That rotation is kind of a big problem because for the pe people that had guns affected by the rotation, they'd end up having dead triggers every once in a while. So not something you'd want on any gun, uh, especially a carry gun. Now, as quickly as I can, I wanna run through uh, most of the mods on this one. We'll start kind of from the top down. So starting with the slide, this is, as you can see, milled by Jaeger Works. Uh, they did really good work, uh, super fast turnaround time. I wanna say I had my slide back from them within the same week that I sent it out, and that's amazing. I, I don't think they can promise you those times uh, normally, but part of it was just that I, I got it returned back to me without getting recoded. I do the coatings myself. Um, but as far as the work goes, I will say I really, really like the design. Very functional design, having the chamfer that goes, or the chamfer cuts all the way here, and then on the top as well. Um, those are optional, of course, but I think that that adds a lot of functionality for those of us who like to manipulate the side, slide from the front. Um, obviously, they also milled it for the RMR, and something I really liked about the CZ P10 in general, but especially about the way they mill this, is that if you look, they mill that so low that basically the bottom portion of the frame for that glass is just even with the top of the slide i love that it looks like that uh rmr belongs on this gun um, it's also if you can see from the width pretty much the exact same with the slide and that it just looks nice to me something interesting that jaegerworks does that i have not heard any other company is doing is that they actually angle this cut very slightly downward uh this way sorry i'm looking through the camera but they angle that cut slightly downward this way so the front sits ever so slightly lower than the back i want to say it's some some fraction of a degree so nothing significant but they just do that so you have a little bit of extra room to adjust for elevation uh, within your rmr not that you'd really be running out um, i went with irons ford on, on this gun just because i wanted to test that out i've never had a gun like that but i will say one nice thing about having irons ford is that you have you know something to protect your optic if uh, you know brass is flying back or if you're really doing your best impression of Aaron Cowan slamming your optic into stuff or uh, trying to rack the slide off something up here. Uh, I went with Dawson Precision uh, Sights. This is actually a Glock MOS rear and a CZP-10 front. Uh, I will say if you're gonna, or whatever sights you go with for co-witnessing, um, you're gonna have to do some experimentation. Dawson is really good about this because they can help you if you call them, figure out what sight uh, or what heights you need. With everything zeroed up, I believe, my irons are, or my front irons, just a little bit too high. So I might end up replacing this one, but it doesn't bother me too much. Like I said, I coated this myself. This is kind of like my quote unquote signature uh, color. I uh, just burnt bronze with graphite black over the top, and then I distress it uh, as well. Really like the way that finish looks. Um, kind of holds up well to wear, or it wears really well, you know, when it starts to wear away in the high spots. It kind of just looks like it's supposed to be like that. One last thing I wanted to mention about the optic placement here, being that it's so far back, from your chamber. Um, it's really nice that you don't get as much blowback here. On other guns, like I have a Springfield XD here, um, guns like this, they have to have that optic mounted super far forward and there is a loaded chamber indicator. Uh, or even on my 1911, which I don't have in front of me, um, that optic just sits further forward. Perfect recipe for, for blowback getting on your lens, which is not a huge problem, just a minor inconvenience though if you're shooting for a long time. You're gonna get some powder blowback on your lens, it's gonna turn black and you have to wipe it off every once in a while. But not nearly as much of a problem with that optic sitting so far back. Sorry, and I'm kinda jumping all over the place, but one more thing I wanted to say about uh, the sights, the backup irons. Um, I don't know how well I can represent this on video, but to the extent that you can see that, I went with sights that are not suppressor height per se, because I wanted it to be the lowest possible co-witness that I could get. So you can basically, when you have that optic or that dot in your window, you can basically barely see my irons at all. And that's exactly what I wanted. I did not want the uh, irons to obscure my window at all. Um, I have a 1911 milled for an RMR as well. And the backup irons sit a little bit too high for my liking. They take up like a good third of the entire window, which on an RMR, the window is already so small. Um, I just rather not have my vision obscured. The only thing I've changed internally here is the actual striker itself. I've heard a lot of reports of people breaking strikers or the tips of their strikers breaking off. Um, so I originally changed that for a Suarez uh, striker and I thought that was all good. Uh, the machining was good. It's tool steel as well, which is really nice. But 
the first one I got, I broke. Uh, and I broke it within, I wanna say like 100 rounds. So not very promising. Currently in the gun, I have a Cajun Gunworks tool steel striker, which honestly is probably like the same part or very similar, um, but that one's been holding up just fine. Uh, I'd like to give the benefit of the doubt to Suarez um, and say that that was probably just a fluke, but I do have to mention it because it broke. And on a carry gun, that would be a huge deal if you had a broken striker and you didn't know about it and you know you need to use your gun to, to defend yourself and it just doesn't go bang and it can't because the striker doesn't work. So be careful if you're changing that one out. This does not belong on a CZ. This is actually part of a takedown lever from a Springfield. In my other video, I mentioned that as well. I'm not gonna get too deep into it, but basically I put this on almost all my guns because I wanna have a bit of a gas pedal slash thumb rest. It's a slim thing, it's a piece of metal, so I don't have to worry about it wearing away or anything over time. And I don't think it looks crazy bad. It doesn't look normal, for sure, but it doesn't look bad. Backside here, you'll notice this uh, business. This is actually part of an Inforce uh, beaver tail adapter for a Glock. Now, obviously, it's not a Glock. This does not fit this, so if you're gonna try to do this, make sure you're pretty well-versed or pretty comfortable welding polymer uh, and reshaping it. But basically, all that was for is I don't know if uh, I can demonstrate this very well with this gun, but if I take this other grip over here real quick, the CZ, Glocks, and this gun as well, the XD, they have a pretty deep, um, I don't know what you want to call that, but it's basically just cut out. It's recessed really deep in here where the web of your hand goes in. And I get that that's so that you can get a high grip, high deep grip, and that's all good and well. But the problem with that is that this dimension from here where your trigger is and here to the web of your hand, it's so small compared to the width of the rest of the grip. Same thing was especially true for the CZ. So I'd get my hand really high and really far in there and then it would feel like the grip on the top was just so skinny and then the bottom was so fat. It didn't make any sense to me, was not comfortable. So after like a few weeks of shooting this gun, I decided to do something about it and this was my favorite solution. Uh, doesn't look great. I, I could do well to clean that up and I probably will at some point, but for now it's very functional and just kind of magically the texturing matches up so well with the actual stock CZ texturing there. This is a Suarez face shooter trigger. Um, now I will say again, this is the second one I've been through actually. The first one that I had, the return spring, the safety return spring, so not the actual trigger spring, that's part of the gun on the inside, but the spring that is responsible for this safety tab moving inward and outward broke. It snapped in half and it kind of got stuck inside the trigger. I had to take the gun apart. And even then, it's like if you don't have a return spring on your safety, um, it gets caught really easily on the actual frame of the gun. So that's not good. I'm hoping this one holds up and so far so good, uh, but something I'll watch out for for sure. The Suarez trigger, I like that a lot. I'll talk about that a little bit more later in this video, but I just did want to mention that mod there. Um, last couple of things, one is going to be base pads. This is not the one that I carry with because that's unfinished. I carry, I mean, it's same setup, but I carry with a, this is actually a UTG plus zero base pad that originally was maybe half an inch long. The uh, reason I got that is because they're made out of aluminum and that allows me to make these base pads or basically saw them or chop them off to be quite a bit thinner. Um, if you look at a factory magazine, uh, that's not a huge difference, a huge visible difference, but they are, you know, quite a bit thicker than these aluminum ones that I've kind of hacked up myself. So I prefer to carry the gun with an aluminum base pad, uh, just because it's a little bit slimmer, prints a little bit less. Oh, and then final thing I wanted to mention was just, I kind of half bobbed the end of my back strap here. So I cut a little bit of a corner off there, rounded it out and polished it so that it doesn't print nearly as much. And like these two things here, seems like, such a trivial mod, but that does make a big difference when you're carrying, especially because this is a double stack gun. Uh, last thing I guess worth mentioning is the light. This is an Inforce um, PL Pro Valkyrie. Uh, great light, 1500 lumens, rechargeable as well. Um, really love these lights. I love the original uh, PL Pro as well, or PL2, I believe they called it. Um, but I also carry this gun quite often with a TLR7. And I will probably at some point do a review, a dedicated review for lights um, or individual lights, but I will say this is a great light in theory, pretty bright, 500 lumens, you know, fits the gun really well, but the switches just, they're terrible. They're really badly uh, implemented. I wish they had done something different with that. And I hope that they do something with that, but these are just terrible switches. Um, I'll still carry the gun like that. It's just, 
if I ever needed the light, I, I don't have a lot of confidence that I'd be able to actuate those switches very well. And yeah, that's a training thing, I know, but it's just, I'd, I'd, I'd want something better. Okay, so now that we have gone through all of this gun and you know what it is and you know the mods and stuff, um, let's talk about the other categories. So starting with reliability, I feel like that's the most important thing for a carry gun. Uh, and I will preface this by saying I don't have as many rounds through this gun. I have uh, probably not even a thousand yet, uh, to be completely honest. And I know that's not really a fair evaluation, but from what I've seen so far, um, and if you want to, you can look up other reviews as well. Uh, I don't think people are having very many problems. These guns did really well in like torture tests as well. So like throwing them in mud and dirt and so on. They do really well with that. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that, just double checking this is clear. If you look inside the gun, the rails and the portion of the rails that it interfaces with on the slide, it's so, such a small area, just there, and just here. That's the only thing that interacts with the slide really. Because of that, uh, along with generally loose tolerances, it makes for a gun that uh, if you were to get it dirty or wet or whatever, it still should run pretty well. It should be able to clear that dirt just fine and still be able to fire. Whereas something tighter fit, tighter tolerances like my 1911 might not. I've not had a single malfunction um, yet, so like no failure to feeds, no stovepipes, anything like that. The only problem I've ever had was a broken striker, but again, just to remind you guys, that was not a CZ part, that was actually a Suarez part. Uh, so as far as I can tell, the gun itself, very reliable, and in theory on paper should be as reliable as anything else available. Because this gun is polymer, you know, it's plastic, and the, uh, the slide is now coated in Cerakote, um, I have every bit of confidence in this gun that it would hold up if I, like let's say if I got it wet and I decided I didn't want to clean it, that's fine. Uh, I don't really care too much either, like I live somewhere where that's very very hot during the summer and that means that when I'm carrying this entire side of the gun here that's exposed to my, my skin, it gets all sweaty and gross. And with, like, with my 1911 I like to go home after being out for a bit and wipe it off, put a little bit of oil just to make sure I'm protecting the finish. I don't think it needs that because it's a black nitride, but I still worry about it a little bit. For this, I don't have to because it's plastic, right? And that's kind of a nice thing. I don't know if that really falls under reliability, but I'm putting it into this category because it's something that I, I thought about when buying the gun. So going on to the next category, which will be shootability, um, kind of broken up into a few subcategories. First being accuracy. So I will say uh, mechanical accuracy on this gun is probably not as amazing as it might be on like a Hanfit 1911. Uh, those guns that have you know really tight tolerances, especially between the barrel and your slide, uh, those will be inherently more accurate. However, I don't know if that really matters when you're shooting, especially in a self-defense context. I'm not sure it would matter, but I can tell you this for damn sure. Uh, taking this gun out to like 80 yards, and I'll throw in a clip here if I have one, uh, 80 plus yards, it is much harder to make shots, even with the optic, uh, compared to my 1911. I normally carry and shoot a 9 millimeter Commander 1911, full steel gun, hand fit parts, uh, with an optic as well, so you know it's a fair comparison. And I will say, it might be me, like it might just be a training thing, maybe I suck at shooting this gun and I can't pull the trigger as straight back as I can on the 1911. That's very well possible, but I also do think you could attribute some of that to looser tolerances. As far as accuracy goes, I mentioned the trigger. Uh, you know, a 1911 is really easy to shoot accurately because the trigger is so good. And this is not really an exception to that. I think striker fired guns generally don't have as nice of a trigger and they can't have as nice of a trigger as a single action um, gun. but. Striker fired guns basically, if you can get it to be anything like this where you have a tiny bit of take up, break, and minimal reset, like that's pretty good, right? That's probably among the best striker fire triggers that I've ever touched. Um, and part of that has to do with the trigger itself. The Suarez trigger took away a lot of that pre travel. Um, I like the fact that it's somewhat flat faced. Side note about that though. This safety tab from factory is actually not flat face. It sticks out proud by maybe, I don't know, some fraction of a millimeter uh, or maybe like a sixteenth of an inch. So like even when you have it fully depressed, it's still gonna stick out forward from the rest of the trigger shoe by some amount. To the point that this trigger actually feels like it's not flat, like it's almost rounded on the front. So something important to consider if you are looking for a flat face trigger. In mine, I modified it, of course, as I do with everything, and this now sits flush to the rest of the trigger shoe when I have it uh, you know, all the way pinned back. Uh, another thing that's really important about the feel of a trigger is over travel. So you'll see this weird block looking thing back here. That is kind of my crude over travel stop. 
I've done things in the past, like really quickly, and I'll make a video about this again at some point. This XD was kind of my guinea pig for a lot of mods that I've done, but this XD has an internal over travel stop that I added in, and the trigger is great. But the only thing I don't like about that idea is that if that internal trigger or internal over travel stop ever were to break and fall apart inside the gun, it'll probably render my gun useless. It won't be able to clear out of the gun anyway. Uh, or very unlikely. Whereas this, if this were to break, my over travel stop, I mean, if that were to break off, it's just gonna fall off the gun. And then I have a longer over travel and the gun still works. So for a carry gun, I felt like that was a better idea. Probably can execute this a little bit better and I probably will clean this up at some point. But for now, while I'm filming this video, this is what it looks like. And then when it comes to accuracy, the last thing I wanna talk about is that optic. Um, I've said this before in another video about my 1911, but the optic makes it so easy. You know, you line up that, that dot with your target, you pull the trigger properly, and you're gonna hit your target pretty much every time. I have quite a few optics, and this is the one I keep coming back to. Uh, I don't have enough money that I can justify spending a ton to have an RMR on all my guns, so some of them still don't. Um, but this is the one I would trust my life with in, in all situations, so that's what I'm using. It is, for those of you wondering, an RMO9, so one MOA dot, adjustable LED version. Uh, for me, that helps a lot. I have astigmatism. If you do as well, if you just have poor vision, the smaller dot actually helps quite a bit. Uh, with the pre precision and uh, kind of adjusting or I guess accommodating astigmatism if you have that. So uh, I guess the last subcategory of shootability is handling. Um, I feel like the ergonomics of this gun are, are pretty good to, to begin with. Compared to something like a Glock or an XD, um, the actual like radiuses around the front and back are quite round. So it actually fits the shape of the human hand quite well. Whereas, you know, Glock, a lot of people complain about it feeling kind of boxy or like a brick. And I, I would have to agree. As that slide is so short, you can get your hand quite high up. And also you'll notice I have plenty of room for my pinky there. I have quite large hands. I wear lar large or extra large gloves usually. So just for perspective, uh, if you had gigantic hands, gigantic mitts, you'd still be able to get a full grip on this gun, I'd have to say. Um, another really nice thing is that the texture from factory is really good. So notice these squares here that they put, they actually don't do much of anything. And that's fine, like they don't abrade your, your stomach or anything when you're carrying. But something that's really nice is that the front and back strap, these, whatever these are, these pyramid shapes, these are super aggressive. Some people complain about it, like it's too sharp. I think that's great though. I feel like that's where you need grip the most. And this is the only gun I own that I've not wanted to stipple. So I'm probably gonna leave it that way. I'm really happy with the grip. Uh, I think it works really, really well. The only thing, like I mentioned earlier in the video, is that grip angle or that kind of palm swell I wasn't a big fan of, so I filled in some of this area here with that grip force adapter. And I've been really happy with that. The uh, grip angle is not quite as vertical as a 1911, um, but it does do two things for me. One is it kind of increases that grip angle or gets it closer to vertical. So it's something that I'm more familiar with coming from a 1911. And the second thing is that it actually increases the reach. So the distance from here to the front of my trigger. I have, like I said, pretty big hands, very long fingers, like unusually long fingers. So anything that can increase that reach for me helps quite a bit. Um, before the stock trigger, when it was curved and everything, and I reached all the way back to the back of the trigger guard, um, it just felt like my, my index finger was so far back. Like I was really reaching and kind of contorting my finger funny to get that trigger to break. And again, that's a training thing, right? I could train around that, but I'd rather not if I don't have to. There's no safety uh, other than the trigger safety. Uh, so very much like a Glock and an MMP and whatever else. Uh, it's nice because compared to the 1911, there's one less step for me to worry about. I don't think that safety guns, uh, if you train with them well, and especially like with the 1911 style safety, I don't actually think it makes any difference in time. But, you know, people always make the argument, like, what if you forget? Or what if you don't train enough and you uh, miss that safety when you need to use your gun? And I kind of, I get that. So it's nice not having that. I, I want to say I might be like a fraction of a second faster with gun, this gun if I were to train with it enough. But that's just theory. It's not actually happening in practice just yet. I will say that this gun uh, and polymer guns in general are snappier than full steel. Um, and I've, I guess I would, I would agree that that's true for this gun. Definitely pretty snappy. That slide seems to be moving very fast. Um, but one thing that's nice about this and something that I have not really understood that well until recently, people always say like, oh, like that gun, it shoots really flat or it, you know your sights come back to target very quickly and i've heard people say that but i've never experienced that with, with a uh, a polymer gun before or a lighter gun in general i've always had like lighter polymer guns like an xds or my xds um 
or even shooting others like Glocks. I've never had that experience where, you know, again, I know you can't see this, but where, you know, you have that shot break, that slide comes back and it pulls that gun up and then it kind of naturally just tracks right back on a target. I've never had that before until this gun. So I will say, despite the fact that there's more felt recoil, it's a little bit snappier, um, doesn't bother me too much because the sights come back to target pretty naturally or pretty easily. Um, one more thing about handling is that this gun and generally double stack guns are going to be a little bit faster and easier to reload properly. There is very slight chamfering on the inside here um, to help you with those reloads, but the biggest thing is that your magazine is, is tapered, right? So it's basically funneling itself into that mag well or into your grip, whereas the gun that I'm used to, it's a single stack, so I have to be very precise with my reloads. I, I will say right away that I'm faster reloading this gun than I am with my current carry gun. Uh, so interesting note. The last category is concealability. Uh, and I will say for a double stack gun, this is pretty slim. Um, it's not as narrow like in this dimension as my 1911, uh, being a single stack, of course. Uh, but I don't think it makes a huge difference. And this is a hell of a lot lighter. Uh, the 1911 and the setup that I carry it with this lights and armor and so on, that gun measured with an unloaded magazine weighs 42 point something ounces. This weighs 29 ounces. So that's like three fourths of a pound or more than three fourths of a pound difference. Which when you're carrying a gun all day in your waistband, that does definitely make a big difference uh, not having that extra pound essentially on your belt. So even though this gun takes up a little bit more space, uh, and I would actually say it conceals a little bit worse, uh, it's way lighter, so in that sense, it's a little more comfortable. But because the grip is a little bit thicker this way, um, and these mags do kind of get squared off, or they are squared off in the factory, um, it does print a little bit more at the corner. So like right over here, it prints a little bit more. I mentioned that mag mod though in the beginning or earlier in the video where that does make a big difference for concealability, so something to consider. Having a good holster makes a huge difference. For me, um, I make holsters, I don't sell them, but I think a lot of little things like, you know, having that wing there, thin metal clips uh, on the backside. I can't demo this very well, but there's some extra Kydex that kind of loops around here to create a bit of a standoff. This is actually uh, neoprene padding that I'm experimenting with as well. But all this stuff basically does the job to tilt the gun toward my body this way and handle inward this way. So it never really gets away from me too much. This is probably like a compact compact gun, probably the smallest size that I'd feel comfortable fighting with. Which brings me to my next point. Um, kind of overall, in conclusion, I really do enjoy shooting this gun. It's a lot of fun. It's very different than what I'm used to. It tracks a lot, moves a lot faster. So it's a, a different experience. But uh, I do have every bit of confidence that this gun will work in almost any situation. If it's dirty, even if I don't take care of it, even if I don't maintain it the way I normally would. Uh, this is a good like what if gun, like end of the world situation, right? Apocalypse is going on as if that would ever happen. Uh, if I didn't have the time or the effort to put into maintaining my gun like I do in the 1911, I could see the 1911 becoming very unreliable very quickly uh, if I don't take care of that. Whereas for this gun, I feel like I could throw it in a pile of mud and pick it up and it will be fine for years after that. Um, that might not be true, but it seems to be the case in a lot of the tests that you, know, you can see on YouTube or uh, even just in my experience shooting. This is probably harder to conceal than my other gun, but slightly comfier. And then coming back to that, that statement I made previously, or that question uh, of, like if somebody told me when I was leaving the house today that I was 100% surely gonna get into a gunfight, which gun would I want, right? For me, the answer is still a 1911. I would still want that gun, and I think that comes down to uh, like comfort, familiarity, and just having more time training with that. But I'd be really interested to see if I carry this long enough, if that answer changes, for one thing. Uh, and then also, something else to consider is, like let's say, you know, God forbid something were to happen like this, but if you had to use a gun to defend yourself, best case scenario, it's a good shoot, you're justified, you don't go to court, uh, you don't go to jail or anything, but they still take your gun, right? They take your evidence, whatever. And you're gonna be without that gun for a while. So you kind of have to think to yourself, or at least one small consideration needs to be, how much would it cost for you to replace your, your carry setup? Uh, for the 1911, that would probably cost me in the range of like 3,000, 3,500 for this gun probably in the range of like 1700-ish, which is, I know it's a ton of money for a polymer gun, but that's just how I built it. Um, and that's something to think about though, because that's a good chunk of change that if you don't have it lying around, that might be uh, a bad situation where you're without your carry gun or anything like it for a while. 
Anyway, that's all I got for this video. If you enjoyed watching this, please uh, give me a like, drop me a comment down below, subscribe if you want to do that. And I'm totally open, open to suggestions for future videos, so if you have any ideas, just let me know in the comments down below. Uh, I'm looking forward in the future to reviewing some stuff like perhaps pants or uh, recently I got some shorts that I'm really a big fan of. They don't look super tactical. Uh, that's kind of the point. I don't dress like this most of the time. I look pretty normal in my everyday life. And uh, I've got a lot of buddies with guns that would be cool to review as well. So if you have any ideas or you want to see any of that stuff, just let me know in the uh, comments down below. But for now, uh, that's it. So thanks for watching. Be well. Take care. Peace.